Wow. Thank you. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling sea. The words of Shakespeare, appropriately said here on the stage of the Shakespeare Theater, classic words. Classic in the sense that it connects us through time, place, our disparate walks of life, through generations, hundreds of years, it connects us, intersects us with our humanity. Something that will last long after we're gone. That is the thing that makes something classic, especially in the arts. Now, while my father thinks I was invited here because of my good looks and charm, it's really because I am an actor. No, I am not Cedric the Entertainer. Name is Wendell Pierce. While I live in New York and Los Angeles, I am from New Orleans. Yeah. That northernmost Caribbean city, the last Bohemia. True. Yeah, if you want to go to the Caribbean, come down to New Orleans, baby. <laughs> that last Bohemia, one of the great incubators of culture in the world. It was destroyed 10 years ago in the great flood of Katrina. And my home, I thought I would never see again. And I realized that there would be years that would go by and some child would come up to me and ask, Mr. Pierce, in New Orleans' darkest hour, what did you do? And I realized I needed to have an answer. I'm an actor, so I wanted to respond with one thing that I knew and what I do, act, perform. So along with the Classical Theater of Harlem and Creative Time, I did a production of Waiting for Godot and the Lower Ninth Ward in the midst of the disaster at ground zero where you could look for miles around and see nothing. Everything had been washed away on that hallowed ground where so many people had died through no fault of their own, where 1,800 people of my heritage, of my city, of my neighbors who had died on that hallowed ground. And in that play, Samuel Beckett wrote something that was classic, that can speak to people through time, through place, over generations. Two men in a void, nothing but a road and a tree, trying to find out who they are, what their existence is all about, where did they come from, where are they going, what are they going to become? Can they find help from Godot, who ultimately never comes? an existential piece of theater done in the Lower Ninth Ward, but first done when Nazis occupied France. It spoke to the isolation that Mr. Beckett was going through. In the Balkans, during the Balkan Wars, Susan Sontag did a performance that inspired people there during the midst of their darkest hour through ethnic cleansing and when people saw the ugliest, most violent parts of human nature. And then we did it in the Lower Ninth Ward. It was there that I realized an awakening, an epiphany for me. It was a reminder of the power of art, the reformative, rejuvenation, the revelatory power of art. Art is not just entertainment, as the E represents here in TED. It is something that is tangible and real, the power of art. What thoughts are to the individual when you lie awake at night and reflect on who you are, where you've been, where you hope to go, your triumphs, your weaknesses, your flaws, your great character. What those thoughts are to the individual, art in this forum is to the community as a whole, where we gather like we're gathered here today and reflect on who we are, where we've been, who we hope to become, where we failed, where we've triumphed, what are our values, but then more importantly, declare our values and then act on them. That is the tangible nature of art. It is not something just reflective. It is visceral. It is real. I had an awakening when I did that play because I knew there was something in it that made it the most cathartic moment of not only my life, but all of those citizens from New Orleans who were gathered there that day realizing that in their darkest hour, 
they would have to find something within themselves to survive, to thrive, to rejuvenate themselves, to rebuild their lives. That is the lesson of waiting for Godot. Find that power within yourself and not outside of yourself. Don't wait for an entity that never comes. Don't wait for FEMA, as we learn <laughs> in New Orleans. Find and exercise your right of self-determination. So it was an epiphany for me. And I documented it. This is the story of my homecoming. This is the story of my past in the pilgrimage of my family and my people out of exile. It is a story of faith, hope, and love. It is a story that begins with a slave child waving goodbye to his family on the banks of the river as the boat carried him south into an abyss of suffering. That I am here to tell the tale as at all means it is not tragedy. It means that as long as we draw breath, tragedy, even a tragedy as overwhelming as a hurricane that nearly destroyed a city, does not have to have the last word. Like the poet W. H. Auden says, we stagger onward rejoicing. Those car lights I saw that night on Claiborne Avenue Bridge belonged to New Orleanians who were also a part of that pilgrimage. I did not know it then, and they didn't either, but I am certain of it now. Those fellow pilgrims were headed into the Lower Ninth Ward to affirm by their presence that the power of art, the bonds of the beloved community, the perseverance of the human spirit are all lights that the darkness cannot overcome. In American culture, we have turned away from an awareness of the prophetic power of art, of its role as a means of revealing the hidden order beneath everydayness and its power to transform us and the world. Art tells us who we are, it tells us who we must become. Art doesn't give us life's answers as much as it empowers us to live life's questions. That's the power of art that we've always knew was real in New Orleans. The other epiphany I had, I come from a culture, that intersection of people and life itself, that intersection is culture, how people deal with life. And we lived it in New Orleans, we lived our culture, it literally gave us sustenance, scraps from the table, a little flour and oil, you put it in a pot, you make that roux and you build this beautiful piece of art called gumbo. <laughs> Something that literally gives you sustenance. We have social aid and pleasure clubs. Y'all understand the pleasure part. That parade coming down the street, the grand marshal, handkerchiefs in the air, umbrellas high, and the band swinging. But it was benevolent associations. Don't forget the social aid and pleasure club. The social aid was that safety network where black folks during Jim Crow segregation couldn't get burial plots. We didn't have Obamacare then. We couldn't get health care. We were redlined by insurance companies, so we pooled our money in the old African tradition of resourcefulness to say, if your mama takes sick, here's a little something for you. If your daddy dies, we're going to send him off nice, and we're going to buy that burial plot for you. That was the Social Aid and Pleasure Club. Art as an act of social justice, tangible and real, a benevolence and a social safety network for people who didn't have access to opportunity. And then ultimately, right there in Congo Square, in New Orleans, the power of art was demonstrated generations ago, where captured Africans found their freedom in their creativity before they found their own physical freedom out of slavery. It was in Congo Square, you took that African six, and they heard the brass music of their European captors, and they merged it and created something about insurrection, about freedom, about finding your own creativity within restriction, freedom within form, the ultimate balance of jazz. American aesthetic on display in art, freedom within form, honoring technical proficiency, but giving the individual the right to be a soloist, an improvisation, improvisationalist. That's the thing that gives art power. That's the thing I realized that dark night in the Lower Ninth Ward when I did Waiting for Godot. 
It was that awakening, reminding me of that power of art, reminding me of New Orleans' use of that power of art going back in generations. And so it was a call to action to me. I lived in a neighborhood called Pontchartrain Park. It was born in the 1950s and post-World War II, New Orleans, Levittown, during the ugliest days of segregation, where we couldn't even go to the park as black folks in New Orleans except on Wednesdays, Negro Day. Your black butt should not be seen amongst the greenery unless it was on Wednesday. So we fought against that. A.P. Turo, a great civil rights lawyer, started the advocacy so we could have access just to green space. And Pontchartrain Park was born to appease this movement, separate but equal, but we took it. Took something ugly and made it beautiful. A thousand homes and 200 acres centered by this beautiful golf course designed by Joseph Bartholomew, who was an African-American landscape architect who designed most of the courses in New Orleans, but he couldn't play on them. He used to walk the course at night and, and, and check on his designs. I actually think they stole that scene for Bagger Vance when Will Smith walks the course with his lantern at night. That's what Mr. Joe used to do. And out of this beautiful neighborhood, we made something ugly, into something beautiful. It became like a little Mayberry, a little black Mayberry. My father fought in World War II in Saipan, and his school teacher wife, my mother, came there and bought a home and raised three sons. It became an incubator for black talent. Dutch Morial, our first black mayor. Mark Morial, who is now the president of the National Urban League. Lisa Jackson, I grew up with her, the EPA director in the Obama administration. Terrence Blanchard, who's a Grammy Award-winning jazz musician. I think I put myself in that number now came out of Punch and Train Park. So out of that art, there was the awakening that I, had, I too should honor the legacy that was given to me of resistance. Use your art for social justice. So I put out a call to action to, to my former residents and present residents to come back. We were in the deepest part of the flooding, but I said, we too should exercise our right of self-determination. So I put together the Punch and Train Park Community Development Corp. And in these past seven years, brick by brick, block by block, house by house, we have rebuilt the neighborhood with geothermal, solar-powered homes, 40 to date, and we are back in full force. And that all came from the power of art. It is not just a piece of entertainment. It's an opportunity to exercise your right of self-determination to know that you as a, have the ability as a community to declare your values, declare what is important to you, and exercise your right of self-determination. We see examples of it throughout the world, even here in Washington, when an actor from California told us about it's morning in America. In Portland, in Portland, in Poland, kind of the same. Lech Walesa, a poet, moved a captured people in solidarity to freedom. And in New Orleans, we all know and remember where we were when we first heard, do you know what it means to miss New Orleans and miss her each night and day? And I tell you one more, when you miss the one you care for more than you miss New Orleans after that flood. We thought we would never see New Orleans again. But she's back. She's more beautiful. She's more beloved. And she is an incubator of talent. She is an incubator of culture. What is on display is how culture is the intersection of life and its people. That intersection is what we thrive on as a people. The forum will re-reflect on what is important to us, declare our values, and then act on them. That is the power of art. Exercise your right of self-determination. And remember, it is not just a piece of entertainment. It is a visceral part of who we are as a people, who we are as a society, and who we are as a world. Thank you. <laughs>